All right, I'm going to do a little study today on segmented sleep and the Bible. Now, last time I was outside, uh, did an outdoor sermon there on um, entering God's rest. And I talked about this thing of this sleep technique and uh, we had been trying it. I think we only were doing, had tried it for like three or four days at that point. So I thought, well, we really need to spend more time um, trying this out before I can really definitively say this does work. And so we've been trying it now since then, and uh, it definitely does work, and uh, very amazing. And I would like to be doing this study outside, but uh, there's just so many things that are going on right now with the ministry and just work here at the ministry headquarters, and um, it just, you know, isn't going to happen right now. And of course, you know, the mosquitoes and black flies and everything are starting to come out, you know, and get worse, uh, especially in the evenings. But um, so I'm going to do this study indoors today. I will be getting back out again in nature to do more studies. But, uh, you know, as I explained in kind of an earlier ministry update this year, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I mean, that's that's part of the stuff that, that goes on behind the scenes. A lot of people don't understand. Uh, we don't live in some kind of a palatial uh, mansion that uh, we have servants that walk around and do all of our work for us. <laughs> you know, I mean, we we have a lot of stuff that goes on uh, that's not seen on camera, and I, you know, uh, I don't share a lot of that stuff simply because a lot of people don't need to know it. First of all, secondly, you know, we're not uh, internet junkies that tell everything, every, all of our business on Facebook all the time or something like that. You know, so. Um, that's why we do appreciate people's prayers too. And by the way, there's other ministry things that we do that are not related to the video ministry. So there's other stuff that goes on too there. Um, but uh, I am going to try to get back to doing more of these Bible type studies. I miss doing those. Uh, it's Again, my time is very limited online. And when I get on there and I see a lot of the bad stuff that's happening, I'm going, because I, I know the way the Bible's pointing and you know the thing of, of Israel coming back into focus prophetically speaking and so we're trying to uh, debunk a lot of this Stephen Anderson stuff and everything else and that is very important because you know he is trying to label all King James Bible believers as anti-semitic hate mongering you know people and stuff like that so it's important that we as Bible believers call him out and say he's not part of us so that's what I've been doing there but how important is it for you to rest? This is a big thing that a lot of people forsake. Go in your Bible to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. It says here, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day and from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, I don't believe for one minute that God was actually tired and worn out and he was really weak or something. I don't think God actually needs to sleep. What was he doing then? He was showing a pattern for us. Okay? Adam is made in God's image and after his likeness. Well, we are made in the image of Adam. Essentially, we are descendants of Adam and Eve. So, God is showing a pattern there that there needs to be at least one day of rest, real good rest, a week. And, and I can tell you right now, I'm not going to quote a lot of studies or anything on this. I mean, you can look this up on your own if you're really curious about it. But sleep, uh, people having sleep problems is a very, very, very serious thing. It can really destroy your health when you start to mess around with not getting enough sleep. Um, you can actually, if you, get, if you don't get much sleep, oftentimes you end up in a worse situation than if you're on hardcore drugs or alcohol or other things like that. I mean, you can have very similar uh, kind of slurred speech and dizziness and... and depression and whatever else from lack of sleep. Uh, that's probably one of the most important things for you is to get good sleep. And I'm going to show you about that. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. First 
1 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to read a bunch of verses here. 1 Kings 18, verse 30. We're going to read down through to chapter 19, verse 8. Okay, it says here, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would come or contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned thy heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Let me just stop there for a minute. Um, if you don't know the story here, you can read the whole chapter. It's an interesting story. There were uh, 450 priests of Baal, and Israel had turned into Baal worship. Okay, Baal, without getting into a whole big study on the whole thing, basically is, is they worship him in different, uh, by different names and whatever else, but uh, one of the things they worship is the sun, the rising of the sun. And if you want to see a modern-day Baal worshiper, uh, look at any Catholic priest or the Pope, and you'll see that he has this big round wafer, and he takes it and he goes like this, and he elevates it. What's he doing? It's the rising of the sun. They are the modern day Baal worshippers. So it'd be like Israel becoming Roman Catholic, essentially, is what was going on back there. And Elijah basically said, okay, we're going to show who the real, you know, who's really worshiping God here, through who the real God is. Your God Baal, or any of your other gods, or you know, the God of the Bible here, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know. And so he did this competition between the two. And, of course, the stupid, you know, prophets of Baal and these priests of Baal, they couldn't, you know, burn their, you know, have fire come down and things. You know, Baal couldn't do anything. You know, which is kind of funny because they're worshiping the sun and it's like there's plenty of fire there. You know, why couldn't Baal you know, send it down? <laughs> Didn't work. But the point is that Elijah, one man versus 450, he does this thing and the fire comes down. And they realize, yes, you know, God is is the real one here, not this Baal guy. But there's a lot of work there that Elijah did. See, a lot of physical labor there. I mean, he he you know builds the picks these twelve stones up and sets the altar up again, which had been broken down, and he he cuts the wood and he and he cuts up the you know the bullock there. Uh, in verse thirty three, cuts the bullock in pieces. I mean, he's, he's doing all this work and everything else. Digs a trench the whole way around the, the altar and all this stuff. I mean, that's a lot of work, a lot of physical labor. It'd make you tired, in other words. Remember that. Verse 40, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. So Elisha kills 450 priests of Baal. You know, and again, you know, it's a pretty good day's work. You know, cutting the heads off of 450 men. I'd tire you out a little bit. Let's continue. Verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, 
like a man's hand, and he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was, was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of, Jehel, of Jezreel. Excuse me. So here he climbs a mountain. After that, he runs. <laughs> you know, I mean, guy's got some energy here. Chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough, Lord. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Very good illustration of what happens when you go for a long... I mean, was there anywhere in here where it said he slept for a little while? No. You know, I don't even know if there's anything in there saying... I mean, there's nothing mentioned, but did he even eat anything in that entire time? I mean, the guy is just worn out physically. I mean, he just did a lot of work. He's running here and running there and building altars and cutting wood and you know, slaughtering a, a bullock and, and, you know, 450 heads getting chopped off, all this other stuff, and see what happened when he got tired. And I can guarantee you, you know, yeah, there was some other things there. He's afraid of Jezebel and whatever else, but it's mostly he's going, oh, I just wish I could die. Just, just take my life now. I'm just, you know, why? Because he's worn out. And look what happens. Verse 5, And as he lay and slept... Under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Okay. So he got proper sleep and food there. I mean, I'm, I'm sure if the angel of the Lord cooks food for you, uh, going 40 days and 40 nights without, you know, eating again, I'm sure it'd be possible. Uh, you know, it'd be pretty interesting. But I wanted to read that story to illustrate the point that proper rest is very important. And when you don't get proper rest, you're going to start to have problems okay i'm talking like nervous breakdown type of stuff you know and and you're gonna to start to fall apart and i'm gonna be the first to admit to you that i have not always uh gotten proper rest uh there have been many times and you can see it in some of my studies i know the um what was the thing on uh this crazy nut military guy uh about the rapture thing you know and he was like saying that you know the rapture uh speed wilson was his name and um yeah there it is rapture prophecy or heresy you know h speed wilson crazy nut that he is and um but it's interesting because you know when i just did the study it was like it had been a while since you know we had gotten any kind of good rest and things because you know we there's so much research to do there's a lot of work to do and it's just like so many times, you know, getting to bed at midnight and or one or two o'clock in the morning or something like this, and you sleep for a couple of hours, and you get up and you go do more work, and then you got to do this, and you got to, and after a while, you're, you know, you're going like this, and and it was just like we tried and, and you know, we try to go to bed early, and and a lot of times, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, and it's just like you're laying there going, you know, staring at the dark room, you know, around you, going okay, you know, just can't get back to sleep here, you know. And I'll tell you what, there was a lot of stress because of that thing of waking up in the middle of the night and, and you know, trying to get to bed early and trying to, trying to work out this schedule for sleep. And it just seemed like nothing worked. 
So it's, it was a thing that I, we were both kind of like, you know, we got to find out some kind of a system, some kind of a thing to get better rest and, and have more energy and everything. Because, you know, I heard the one time um, somebody said that physical health is like a three-legged stool. You have exercise as one leg. You have nutrition is another leg. And then the, th the third leg is uh, sleep, proper sleep. And I believe in that very, very much too, by the way. Uh, if any, if you remove any one of the legs of that stool, the stool falls over. Uh, you need to have exercise, you need to eat the proper foods, and you need to have the proper amount of sleep and rest. So I had heard this thing years and years ago that, um, that they, I heard a guy say that getting one hour of sleep before midnight, anytime before midnight, one hour of sleep is worth two hours after midnight. And, you know, this old wives' fable kind of a deal. And so I thought, you know, in other words, if you would go to bed at 8 o'clock in the evening, then it would be like, you know, and you'd sleep from 8 o'clock till midnight or something, and then till, you know, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning or something like that. Because the old eight hours of sleep thing, you know, you'd actually be getting twice the amount of rest, you know, that you would if you go to midnight and get up at 8 o'clock in the morning, something like that. So I looked into that, and it was like, didn't really see any kind of proof for that. It was kind of like, eh, not really. And most studies that I read kind of all agreed that the first four hours of sleep are actually the best. That's when you sleep the, the, you know, the longest. And so I thought, okay, that, that seems to make sense because that's when you're really tired and your body kind of, you know, is kind of like, okay, we need to rest here. And so you sleep and after four hours, your body starts to kind of slowly wake up again. So I thought, well, all right, that makes sense to me. That's, that seems logical. That's not an opposition of science falsely so-called. Okay, so I was kind of researching in that, and all of a sudden I came across this article on segmented sleep. And I thought, what is this? I'm going to read to you a good article, actually. And um, it's very, very interesting, this whole study. This is called The Myth of the Eight-Hour Sleep. It's actually a BBC article. And uh, you can look this up, just, you know, Google search or something, whatever search engine you use. The myth of the eight-hour sleep. We're not going to read the whole article. You can read it yourself if you want to. Um, but there's different studies that are done here. And uh, it says here, in 2001, historian Roger Eckerich of Virginia Tech published a seminal paper drawn from 16 years of research revealing a wealth of historical evidence that humans uh, used to sleep in two distinct chunks. His book, At Day's Close, uh, Night in Times Past, published four years later, unearths more than 500 references to a segmented sleeping pattern in diaries, court records, medical books, and literature from Homer's Odyssey to an anthropological account of modern tribes in Nigeria. Much like the experience of, of various uh, subjects, these references describe a first sleep which began about two hours after dusk, followed by a waking period of one or, or two hours, and then a second sleep. It's not just the number of references, it's the way they refer to it as if it was common knowledge, Eckerich says. During this waking period, people were uh, quite active. They often w got up went to the toilet or smoked tobacco, and some even visited neighbors. Most people stayed in bed, read, wrote, and often prayed. Countless prayer manuals from the late 15th century offered special prayers for the hours in between sleeps. I'm going to skip down here. In the article it says, Eckerich found that references to the first and second sleep started to disappear during the late 17th century. This started among the urban upper class in northern Europe and over the course of the next 200 years filtered down to the rest of Western society. By the 1920s, the idea of a first and second sleep had receded entirely from our social consciousness. He attributes the initial shift to improvements in street lighting, domestic lighting, and a surge in coffee houses, which were sometimes open all night. As the night became a place for legitimate activity and as that activity increased, the length of time people could dedicate to rest dwindled. Get a hold of that one. People, because of electricity and, and other things, night activities, people all of a sudden started to say, well, I just can't you know, spend all this time at night sleeping and things. And as a result, 
you have people literally walking around in a, in a daze and a stupor and they just live on caffeine all the time to keep themselves awake. It's a problem. But we'll continue here. Skip down a couple more paragraphs. Again, read the whole article if you want. It says, in 1667, Paris became the first city in the world to light its streets using wax candles and glass lamps. It was followed by Lille in the same year in Amsterdam two years later, where a much more efficient oil-powered lamp was developed. London didn't join their ranks until 1684, but by the end of the century, more than 50 of Europe's major towns and cities were lit at night. Night became fashionable, and spending hours lying in bed was considered a waste of time. People were becoming increasingly time-conscious and sensitive to efficiency, certainly before the 19th century, says Roger Eckrich. But the Industrial Revolution intensified that attitude by leaps and bounds. Strong evidence of this shifting attitude is contained in a medical journal from 1829, which urged parents to force their children out of a pattern of first and second sleep. Okay, and that's interesting. Because that was where I kind of, you know, there are certain things that you look at, certain theories and things, and it's like, does it really sound plausible? Is this logical? I don't know. But I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, every baby that's ever born has a pattern of waking up sometime early morning, 2 or 3 o'clock or something like that. The baby, you put the baby down to sleep, they'll sleep for a little while, and they wake up wanting to be fed. Interesting. And yet as we grow up, it's like, no, I, want, I don't want to do it that way anymore. But yet we still have a saying in our, in our culture, I slept like a baby. Interesting. Hmm. Let's keep reading. A couple more paragraphs down. It's a long article. It's seven pages printed out, so you know, I'm not, I can't read the whole thing. But it says here, this could be the root of a condition called sleep maintenance insomnia, where people wake during the night and have trouble getting back to sleep, he suggests. In other words, your, your natural body desire is to have a first sleep, time of being awake, and then a second sleep. It says here, Russell Foster, a professor of circadian body clock, in other words, uh, neuroscience at Oxford, shares this point of view. Many people wake up at night and panic, he says. I tell them that they what they are experiencing is a throwback to the bimodal sleep pattern. But the majority of doctors still fail to acknowledge that a consolidated eight-hour sleep may be unnatural. Now, this is very interesting. And again, you know, this is just, you know, I'm going to show you what the Bible says about this thing. Um, this is not a major doctrinal thing that if you don't, if you sleep for eight hours, you're going to hell or something like that, you know. <laughs> Good night. No, you know, this is this is a uh, meant to be a help to my brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are. And, and even if you're not saved, I mean, this is still a help to you. You know, if you're having trouble with sleeping at night, you wake up in the middle of the night, and you're going, oh, I can't believe it. I can't go back to sleep. Maybe that's your body saying you're supposed to be getting up, you know, and I'll tell you what, since we've been doing this thing um, and we have we've even experimented, we do the thing of first sleep, wake up, and then go back to, to bed again, second sleep, we sleep so much better. It's incredible. But there have been a couple nights we say, okay, let's just experiment and let's sleep the eight-hour thing. You know, and you get up to go to the bathroom occasionally or whatever else. That's fine. But when you have people that are sleeping for eight hours, I mean, think about this for a minute. What if it is unnatural to sleep straight through for eight hours without getting up? I mean, could you go eight hours during the day without going to the bathroom? You know, is it really good for your, your kidneys and things like that to go for eight hours without ever going, getting up to go to the bathroom? I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I know some people, you know, they say, well, I don't have any trouble sleeping and whatever. Okay, whatever. But for those out there that are having trouble with this, um, maybe... When you get up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep, maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it's actually what you're supposed to be doing. And again, you know, since we've been doing this, it's incredible. And on that note, let me just say this too. As far as the thing of sleep, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first four hours of sleep is when your body will get the most sleep. 
And then the second four hours of that eight-hour sleep period is when you'll get lighter sleep. Uh, you won't sleep as deep or as sound. But now what would happen if you could have two of those first four-hour sleeps? In other words, you sleep four hours, get that really good sound sleep, wake up for an hour, two hours at the most, and then go back to sleep and get another of those first four hours. So you have two segments of that really good deep sleep. And I'll tell you, we've been doing this now for, I don't even know, what over a month or something like this. Uh, well over a month, actually. Uh, probably closer to two months. And it is incredible. I mean, our energy level's way up. Our concentration is much better. We get a lot more done during the day because we're not dragging our feet and going around and, uh, you know. And ironically, um, we were, had a, a thing that we needed to do here um, a couple days ago, and we had to be up till 2 o'clock. We were waiting for somebody that was coming here, and we had to be up till 2 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, we ended up trying to get close to eight hours of sleep, but couldn't sleep till 10 o'clock in the morning. But, you know, the point is, uh, we, we got you know, a fair amount of sleep and things, but, man, all day long, it was just like, I, I felt like I was just in a dream world. I mean, I was just, I was so out of it. I mean, we had errands to run and things, and, and it was just like, how in the world did we ever do this in the past? And since we've been doing segmented sleep, whenever we try to do a, a total sleep through the night or or we get to bed really late, uh, you know, it's just like, we just feel like so dead tired. And I can't imagine that that's the way we live for so long. Um, so this is this is really just kind of a, uh, I'm trying to help people out there that if you have trouble with insomnia or things like that, some kind of sleep problems, you might want to try this thing of segmented sleep. Even if you can sleep through eight hours and things like that without really getting up or whatever, you might want to try this thing of segmented sleep. Um, get to bed early. Uh, if you wait till midnight and sleep for four hours and then get up for an hour and then sleep for another four hours, eh, you know, kind of messing around there. Uh, try to get to bed somewhere between 8, 9 o'clock, maybe 10 o'clock at the latest, and sleep for four hours, get up for an hour, and then go back to bed. Try it for a little bit. I mean, it's, hey, it's it's a scientific thing. Experiment. Um, works for us. Maybe it won't work for you. I don't know. But I got to thinking about this, and I thought, if they were doing this in the 15th century, and even 16th century, and on back through, it was just kind of a common thing, that people did, I thought, I wonder what the Bible says. I wonder if there's anything in Scripture that would lean towards this thing of people sleeping in two distinct segments. So that's what I looked up. And that's what we're going to look at now. Job chapter 14. You can turn in your Bible to Job chapter 14. Some of these verses are like, mm, it looks that way. Some of them, mm, not so much so. But uh, we'll, we'll look at these verses. Just kind of an interesting study today. Um, exhortation. Uh, not really a very heavy doctrinal type of a thing here. Uh, but uh, just some interesting ideas for you if you're struggling with the thing of not getting enough rest or not getting adequate rest, I should say. Job chapter 14, verse 12. says here, So man lieth down and riseth not, Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Okay? So see, that proves it. And if you're sleeping for eight hours, you're not rising in the middle of the night, then you're going to hell. <laughs> see, I, you know, I get that stuff put on me so much. You know, oh, Brian's teaching you to go to hell if you don't agree with him in all these different areas. Nonsense. That's why I joke about it, because I think it's ridiculous. But kind of an interesting thing there. You know, that it's just being compared kind of like to a guy dying, essentially. But uh, next we'll go to Psalm chapter or Psalm three. There aren't any chapters, just Psalms. Psalm three, verse five. It says, I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. Interesting. Uh, kind of a, a neat thing there. And it, you know, and you can say, well, it doesn't say that he waked, you know, woke up in the middle of the night and then went back to sleep again. Yeah, I know that. But you know interesting verse. And I'm going to show you later on, by the way, that there is some New Testament scripture that definitely talks about being vigilant in things at night. 
So don't just say, oh, he's just making funny verses here. Thing. I'm going to show you that there are some scriptures later on. But uh, Psalm 4, verse 8. And this is another key to really getting good sleep. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on right now in our world. Uh, there's all this talk of military takeover, Jade Helm 15 and CERN and, and all this stuff. The Vatican, you know, disclosing alien stuff and, and uh, the, making the city of Jerusalem into an international city and, and all the sodomite, sodomite agenda. They're getting more and more violent and saying, you know, we need to force Christian churches to teach that sodomy is okay. You know, of course, they use homosexuality, but I don't use that. But, you know, there's all this stuff, and you can get kind of worried about it. But you got to remember that God's in control. And you can dwell in safety and lay down and, and have peace at night. Uh, when you just give it all over to the Lord and say, you know what, Lord, just protect me through this thing. And uh, that's also very important. I mean, you can get the right kind of segmented sleep and all this other stuff. And if you go to bed with worry... You're not going to get good sleep regardless of what you do. So, you know, rest in the Lord. That's important. Turn next to Psalm 127. Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Why do you have a watchman in the middle, middle of the night? See, there again, we don't understand what that's like. Most of us that live in you know, America or, or the UK or whatever else, we don't understand what it's like to constantly be raided by other you know, heathen peoples and stuff like this. Uh, most of us dwell pretty safely. But there's a night watchman thing there. And it's kind of interesting, those verses right there, you know, uh, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wa waketh but in vain. So, you know, a watchman waking up in the middle of the night is, you know, why even bother if, if the Lord's not going to protect you? Is what it's saying there. It, but it says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Again, if you're worried, you're not going to get sleep regardless of what you do. Interesting. Next, go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3, verse 24 through 26. Okay. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked, when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Okay? And again, we see it again there, and you know, part of this study too is to get you to realize that there are certain things, it just doesn't, you know, worry is not a good thing. Okay? Um, just give it over to the Lord, and just let Him take care of it. And you'll get good sleep. Turn next to Proverbs 4, verse 14 through 19. It says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light, that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Wow. We're going to see a New Testament tie into that later on at the end of the study here. But isn't, you know, there's some pretty incredible stuff going on in that, in those verses there. What did we read in the BBC article? What changed the thing of segmented sleep? Nightlife. People going out on the town and whatever else, not wanting to go to bed. See, that's what changed the thing of segmented sleep. The, you know, not the illumination of, of God in terms of the light that he gives us through his word. You know, thy word is a, is a light, you know, 
lamp on my feet and a light unto my path. Maybe I have that backwards. But, you know, God's word is light. We are light because of that. Uh, we have true light within us. But the world makes artificial lights, electric lights and whatever else. Interesting. Turn next to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. It says here, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that tra uh, travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. Interesting. And again, you know, you can say, well, a rising out of sleep is in the morning. That's after eight hours of sleep. Well, you know, yeah, but you can also make it, you can make the argument there, you know, uh, as far as a sluggard is concerned, you know, a sluggard, you're going to, you know, you might get eight hours of sleep at night and everything and be fine and go about your day. Maybe your body's okay with that. But I can tell you from personal experience that when I was trying to do the eight hours of straight through sleep and, and whatever else, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and get stressed out about it, why can't I go back to sleep and all this? I was quite a sluggard, okay? I was quite sluggish walking around. I mean, we think of sluggard as somebody who just wants to sleep all the time and, and is just lazy. But, I mean, you could also make the argument that somebody that's a sluggard is somebody that's not getting proper rest and is actually just sluggish walking around just like, I mean, because I was in a state of sleep, you know, most of the time, I mean, like I said, there's been some of my older videos, you know, I'm like half asleep doing the video. You know, I mean, you have a high stress job or whatever you're doing like Elijah and where you're doing this and doing that and getting all this other stuff done and you aren't getting proper rest. Before long, you're going to be going around uh, like this. Just some advice. I'm not trying to teach that this is the, the only way and that you have to do it this way and if you don't you know you're in trouble with the Lord or something no no but let's continue Proverbs chapter 19 verse 15 slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep and an idle soul shall suffer hunger you know again slothfulness cast into a deep sleep you know, whereas it's, I mean, it's, and it's weird too, because your body, you know, if you're used to this thing of the trying to sleep eight hours, it might be kind of weird for you at first because you'll be sleeping, you know, you're, you know, and especially if you go to bed really early, earlier than you're normal, normally used to, you go to bed and at first you're like, you know, man, I can't go to sleep. That'll change. You know, that'll, that'll start to change, but you know, you'll be sleeping and you'll be doing good, you know, and you wake up and, and, you know, four hours later and you're like, I really don't feel like getting up. You know, man, I just don't, I don't feel like getting up right now. Oh, well, get, get up, you know. And so you get up and you go walking downstairs or you walk around or whatever else. And man, all of a sudden, it's just like you're going to have all kinds of energy, you know. And that's another thing that's interesting. That, that waking period between first and second sleep, you'll be surprised how much energy you have and how much clarity of thought you have in that time period. It's very interesting. And you go back to bed, and, and I remember, you know, different times I've, I've gone back to bed, and I'm just like wired, just like so excited. And, you know, you go back to bed, and, and it's like I'm going, man, I'm never going to be able to go back to sleep. And, and that's about the last thing I remember, just out you go again for another four hours, and then you get up, and you got all kinds of energy. It's really great. But I can tell you. This thing of uh, trying to sleep and, and everything else, the eight-hour sleep thing, it just doesn't work for, for either of us, my wife or myself. Go next to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 13. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. See, that proves that you're supposed to get up in the middle of the night and go down and have a piece of bread. So, <laughs> just kidding. And, you know, as far as that's concerned, too, you can get a little snack or something like that. You know, we, we do that a lot of times. Sometimes we just talk or whatever else. You know, hey, go to bed, sleep your four-hour thing, get up for an hour or two, and get a little snack if you want to or whatever else. Go back to bed. 
and sleep the rest of the night. Tell you what, it really works. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Here's another one of the key components to getting good sleep. And, uh, you know, I know that everybody can't do this all the time. I understand that. But this is an important thing. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Okay? Uh, the abundance of the rich, if you have a lot of possessions and belongings, and if you're rich and you basically don't do much manual labor anymore, you get a lot of people that are like that. They have maids and servants and... You know, the guy comes and does your lawn for you, and then the woman comes and cleans your house for you, and whatever else. And people like that don't sleep very good. You need to have some physical labor. Again, the three-legged stool. If you have good nutrition, and you're getting good sleep, we'll say, but you don't get good exercise, eventually that's going to affect the sleep. And it doesn't matter. You can be eating the very best foods. If you're not getting exercise and good sleep, the nutrition starts to fall apart. It's important. But if you can do some hard physical labor, uh, you know, or exercise, again, you know, I, I, I never have been into this thing of a gym membership, you know, because to me I just think it's kind of dumb. I mean, just go out and, and do some work around the yard or go do some firewood or just go for a hike out in the woods or or if you live in the city you know i'm sure there's things that you can do in there you know walk a couple blocks or something like this walk to the grocery store and carry your groceries back or whatever you know i mean i'm sure that there's things that you can do for physical exercise but it's very important to have physical exercise and it will help you sleep much better uh, another and that's another thing i want to just say very quickly you can turn your bible to jeremiah chapter 31 a while um, but another another very important aspect of getting proper sleep at night, and this is another rule that we try to abide by, is shut off the internet, any kind of electronic device as far as internet or, you know, if you have a cell phone or whatever else, yeah, there are issues there. But any of that stuff, shut it off at least two hours before you go to bed. You know, the, the electronic stimulation speeds up your... your functions in your mind and things like that and so then you go to you know try to go to sleep it's going to mess up things for you so it's very important to remember that uh, jeremiah chapter 31 verse 25 through 26 it says here for i have satiated the weary soul and i have replenished every sorrowful soul upon this i awaked and beheld and my sleep was sweet unto me Again, you know, I can't say it's definitely teaching segmented sleep, but it just is interesting there. You know, I have satiated the weary soul. I have replenished every sorrowful soul. It's like they're getting rest. Upon this I awaked, first, after your first sleep, and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. You know, and I can tell you, you know, we tried a lot of different things, and nothing really worked until we started doing segmented sleep. It is incredible, you know. And I want to say something else, too. And that is if you're taking any kind of sleep medicine or anything like that, good night. Get off of that stuff, okay. If you, you, know, if you have a doctor, and again, you know, he said in the article there about how that many doctors haven't come aboard on this segmented sleep thing. They just call it insomnia and whatever else. Why? Well, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, you know. And what do they do? Well, you have a sleep problem. Here's a pill. Bad news. Turn next to Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 57. Okay, it says here, and I will make drunk her princes and her wise men, her captains and her rulers and her mighty men, and they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. See, again, proof for segmented sleep. <laughs> and again, you know, I know people are out there probably going, well, yeah, but it could be, you know, sleeping all night and waking in the morning. I understand that. But again, you see this thing of, you know, this 
sleeping very long and a perpetual sleep there meaning death is what's going on there but uh i don't know i just i can't you know i i cannot find an actual verse i'll just tell you there are there are no actual scriptures saying that so and so slept woke up in the middle of the night and slept again but it's like there's things there about waking in the middle of the night and sweet sleep and things like this I don't know. I mean, to me, it just my my biggest argument for the thing would be, why would God create all babies, every single one of them, to basically be born with the concept of segmented sleep, and then you train them not to do segmented sleep? And that 19th century uh, manual for parents was actually telling these doctors were telling parents you need to break your child's segmented sleep pattern tell them it's not normal to to wake up in the middle of the night you know it's kind of an issue next we're going to go to the, the new testament though mark chapter four mark chapter four verse 26 through 27 okay it says here and he said so is the kingdom of god as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. So, you know, I thought that was kind of interesting. It's like, you know, should sleep and rise night and day. Kind of interesting. So he rises during the night and during the day. Could that be segmented sleep? I don't know. And again, see, if it was just common knowledge back in Bible times, they would not have actually come out and said, you know, make sure that you get two, seg or, you know, two segments of sleep per night with a break in between. It would just be common knowledge. I mean, there's no instruction in the, in the Bible about how to take your garbage out or, you know, whatever. I mean, as far as uh, your normal, you know, kitchen scraps or whatever. I mean, why? Well, it's just kind of common knowledge. There's a lot of common knowledge types of things that are going on in the Bible times that there's really no need to write about it. So if segmented sleep was a common knowledge thing in the past, you know, there might not be a real mention of it. But right there, definitely a verse that makes it look like, you know, uh, should sleep and rise night and day. You know, because that's what you do when you do segmented sleep. You rise at night and you rise when it becomes day. So... Very interesting. Turn next to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 10 through 14. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law, and that knowing the time that, it, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Lusts, excuse me, lusts thereof. Okay, so uh, what happens if you... That three-legged stool, again, what happens if you start to mess with that? See, we think of, of lust of the flesh being overindulgence of certain areas. But lust of the flesh can also happen as a result of undersleeping, undereating, not getting enough exercise. See, it can go both ways. Why do you think Elijah is there? Under, I mean, here's this great man of God. You know, God's done all this stuff through Elijah, and yet there he is out running out into the desert, running away from a woman, and he runs out there that she's threatening his life. He just killed 450 priests of Baal. God just, you know, did this amazing miracle. And yet the woman, the queen there, and she's like, I'm going to kill you, you know, tomorrow at this time. You'll be dead. Just like the priests of Baal. My priests of Baal. Because they were, you know, her priests. And, and he runs away from her. And he's out there saying, God, just kill me. You know, why do you think that was? Because he wasn't getting proper sleep. You know, so... Lustly, fleshly problems and stuff like that can come as a result of lack of nutrition, lack of exercise, and lack of sleep. 
another interesting thing. But now finally, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is where we're going to end our study today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Hmm. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. What was the reason over here? What was the reason that people got away from segmented sleep? Because of night life? Interesting. Verse 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And again, that's the main reason for this little study here. Uh, because I want to comfort the brethren that are out there. I know some of you have written to me and talked about, yeah, I can relate, you know, man, I'm just having a really hard time sleeping. I'd recommend trying segmented sleep. Try it out. You know, see how it works for you. And you say, well, brother Brian, though, I, I got to, you know, I got to get up early in the morning to go to my job and stuff, and, you know, whatever, then get to bed earlier. See? Try to work it into your schedule. Try it. I think most people can do it. You know, if you work some kind of a night shift or whatever else, I know some of you do that. Um, when you go to sleep, try the thing of, of segmented sleep. Sleeping for four hours, waking for an hour, going back to bed for four hours. Uh, see how it works for you. Just a thought, okay? So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for truth, Lord. I thank you for this... Uh, segmented sleep thing, and, and uh, Lord, I know your word does not expressly spell it out that that's what we should do, but uh, I, I know that we've been trying it, and it, it works great, and I do pray, Lord, if there's anybody out there that's been struggling, not been sleeping very well, I pray that they too would try it, and that uh, you would show them the truth on this subject. And uh, Lord, I do know that uh, the, the night is far spent. Uh, things are getting so dark right now in this world, that uh, I understand, Lord, that you're going to be taking us out of here before real long. I don't know how long. Uh, you know the timing of it, Lord, and it's not you don't give us the timing because um, then we would be tempted not to work for you. Uh, we would just, just get prepared to leave, I guess. And uh, so, Lord, I do pray that you would help all of us to be convicted in the sense of wanting to get work done, Lord, and, and uh, that we would get excited about your return and, and uh, really try to be ready in, in terms of getting work done for you. And I just uh, thank you, Lord, for truth. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. That's been a study I've been wanting to get out for a long time just to help some of you out there. Uh, it's really helped us. I mean, it's just been literally revolutionary. Uh, I don't know what other word to use for it. I mean, it's just been really great. Uh, this segment and sleep pattern. Uh, very highly recommend it. And uh, please, if you're going to some kind of a doctor thing and they're telling you that you have insomnia or some other sleep problem and you're getting into, you know, taking some kind of prescription medication, get off of that stuff, okay? Um, you know, please get off of that stuff. It's, it's really bad for you. Uh, I would really recommend, you know, praying about this and try to the segmented sleep thing out and uh, see how it works. So that will be it. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you to all who pray for the ministry. Thank you to those who donate to the ministry to keep us going. Um, like I said, there's there's just a bunch of work that, that we're trying to get done right now. And I'm going to try to get 
back into more Bible study type of stuff. Um, might do some expository studies on different books coming up uh, before real long. I'm going to try to get back outside uh, somewhat to, to get some more studies done out there. And uh, But right now, just important to get some, some videos out here in our little recording studio here. So that will be it. And uh, I pray that if you have a hard time sleeping, that you'll try this and see how it works. That will be it. Thank you for watching.